Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional time. This is for uh, Wednesday, August the 9th, 2023. Thank you for being here. And if you want to get your Bibles and open them up, uh, before you do that, hit the subscribe bar and then the notification bell when it pops up. So you'll be notified anytime content's added to the channel. And don't forget, comment on any video, share these videos, like these videos, you know the drill. And so we're going to be looking today at uh, Psalm uh, 25 is where we're going to be starting. Is that right? Let me look up here. Yeah, Psalm 25. And then we will go to uh, Psalm 83, uh, 2 Samuel 15, and then we will finish it out in Luke uh, chapter 6. So if you want to get your Bibles and be turning over to uh, uh, Psalms, Psalm 25, and then while you're doing that, I am going to move over here into the postage stamp. Oh, and today's coffee mug is uh, Colorado. Um, this is one I bought when I lived out there. I have a pretty good extension, uh, extension, extensive collection of coffee mugs. Uh, some of them are still in boxes in storage, and there's several that are in the kitchen that occasionally I just share what I've got uh, as a form of trivia, I guess you could say. You know, interesting but totally useless information. <laughs> okay, Psalm 25, and we got it on the screen. Okay, let's begin. This is the plea for deliverance and forgiveness. It's a Psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. And this is uh, something that I learned in college, uh, put to, to uh, a music uh, rhythm. And you might have learned it that way, too. It's uh, sung at devotionals and that sort of thing. Uh, verse 3, indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindness, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions, according to to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Verse 12. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendant shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. And let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I will wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of their troubles. If you notice, remember David is the king. And when you're a leader, you're, you're going to have enemies. You're going to have people who don't like you, who... You know, wish they who think they should be the king or the the president or the chairman or whatever the position is, and so you're going to have people who don't like you, and no matter what decision you make, you're going to make somebody mad, and uh, especially here in this situation where uh, he's the king, uh, he's got to lead the troops into battle, he's got to be kind of a combination king, uh, prime minister, uh, chief of staff for the military, chairman of the joint chiefs of staff. We would say in America. And so he's going to have afflictions. He's got the, the pressures of office on him. Uh, and so he's really going to be needing to, to lean on the Lord for a lot of this. Uh, there's a lesson there that our modern political leaders uh, really need to think about, that they too have a boss, not just the voters, but they've got one uh, who's higher uh, than that. 
So we'll move on now to Psalm 83. Psalm 83 is a prayer to frustrate conspiracy against Israel, a song, a psalm of Asaph. Do not keep silent, O God, do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent, they thus formed a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the uh, uh, Ishmaelites, Moab, and the Hagarites, Gibel, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria, also join with them. They have helped the children of Lot, Selah. Deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin, as with the uh, brook uh, Kishon who perished at Endor, who became as refuse on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yes, all their princesses like Zeba and Zalmanah, who has said, let us take for ourselves the pastors of God for a possession. Verse 13, O oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind. As the fire burns the woods, and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest, and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek your name, O Lord. Let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the Most High over all the earth. And now we'll go to 2 Samuel 15. 2 Samuel 15, things are heating up, kind of going from bad to worse between David and his son Absalom. So uh, after this, verse 1, after this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and fifty men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, What city are you from? And he would say, Your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me. Then I would give him justice. And so it was, whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put, uh, put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king, for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men for Israel. Now, sometimes in those uh, ancient cultures, the king was basically all three branches of government. Uh, in the United States, we have the executive branch, that's the president. The legislative branch makes the laws, which are supposed to be enforced by the executive branch. And then we have the judiciary, which is supposed to interpret the laws. The king, a lot of times, would be roped into all of these because he didn't have a parliament or Congress, didn't have courts. So it's up to him to make the laws. Is pretty much like a dictatorship. Now, they would sometimes appoint judges, maybe, or counselors, or uh, sometimes, if you remember back in the book of Judges, like uh, Eli, uh, sitting in the gates of the city, the the town elders, uh, the older men of the city, sometimes would sit there in the gate as a sort of city council, uh, and you would come to them. If you had a dispute with your neighbor or some problem, you could come to them. And they would give you advice, or they would make a decision if it was a dispute or something like that. Uh, but ultimately, uh, if the king would ultimately have the say in, in any of these matters. Uh, if you remember, and this is not until many years later, centuries later, but Paul appealing to Caesar. He was a Roman citizen, and that was a right they had, was to have their case appealed to Caesar. Now, once you invoke Caesar... That was it. You're going to Caesar. There's no backing down. There's no, you know what, I think I changed my mind. I'll just take whatever the magistrate here did. Not, uh -uh. Once you appeal to Caesar, <laughs> all right, you know, put him on the boat, send him to Rome. I, I mean, that's it. And so Absalom here, you can see he's building up uh, animosity towards his father. So we've got a problem here with the whole honor your parents thing. He's clearly not. And uh, he's clearly positioning himself to take a, a swipe at the king. Now, there is an old saying that goes back that says, if you're going to try and kill the king or try and take out the king, you better not miss. 
because uh, again, in those days, they didn't have courts they had to go through or due process. Uh, and and kings and dictators they tend to take it a little bit personal if you try to uh, push them off the throne. Uh, normally, you the oldest son would would uh, inherit the throne. Uh, and sometimes, though, they did help push dad uh, to that point where he could inherit the throne. And so Absalom is uh, attempting a, a coup here. Verse 7, Now it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go to Hebron and pay the vow which I made to the Lord, for your servant took a vow while I dwelt in Geshur in Syria, saying, if the Lord indeed brings me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. Then Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went two hundred men invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent for uh, 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 that one guy there, the uh, uh, Gilanite, and David's counselor from his city, from uh, Gilho, uh, while he uh, offered uh, sacrifices. And the conspiracy grew strong from the pe for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. And now this is going to drive uh, David from uh, from his capital. Now a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Uh, excuse me, uh, your majesty, but uh, you've got a problem. You've got a coup that's in the works. So David said to all of his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtakes us suddenly and brings disaster upon us. And the king's servant said to the king, We are your servants, ready to do whatever my lord the king commands. Then the king went out uh, with all of his household after him, but the king left ten women concubines to keep the house. And the king went out with all the people after him and stopped at the outskirts. Then all of his servants passed before him, and all the ch uh, Cherethites, all the Palathites, the Gittites, six hundred men who had followed him from Gath, passed before the king. Then the king said to uh, uh, Ittai, the, the Gittite, Why are you also going with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile from your own place. In fact, you came only yesterday. Should I make you wander up and down with us today, since I go I know not where? Return and take your brethren back. Mercy and truth be with you. But Ataya answered the king and said, As the Lord lives and as my lord the king lives, surely in whatever place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even also your servant shall be. So David said to uh, Itai, I really don't know how to pronounce that, it's another one of those, go and cross over, then uh, the, the Gittite guy and all his men and all the little ones who were with him crossed over. And all the country wept with a loud voice and all the people crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the brook Kidron and all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. There was Zadok also, and all the Levites with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God, and they set down the ark of God. And Abathar went up until all the people had finished crossing over from the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back to the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, Thus I have no delight in you, here I am, let him do to me as seems good to him. And the king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you, uh, Amaz your son, and Jonathan the son of Abathar. See, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore Zadok and Abathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. So David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives, and wept as he went up. And he and his people, had, and he had his head covered and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up, weeping as they went up. Then someone told David, saying, uh, the fall is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of that guy into foolishness. 
Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshipped God, there was uh, Hushiah the archite coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. And David said to him, If you go, with, go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now also be your servant, then you may defeat the counsel of that other guy for me. And do you not have Zadok and Abathar the priests with you there? Therefore it will be that whatever you hear from the king's house you shall tell to Zadok and Abathar, the priests. Indeed, they have there with them their two sons, uh, Amaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, uh, Abathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Uh, so like they like to say in a TV series, when you get to the end of tonight's episode, to be continued. Okay, Luke chapter 6, that will be our final reading today. Luke chapter 6, uh, first 16 verses. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But Jesus answered them and said, Have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him. Now he went into the house of God and took and ate the showbread and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he said to them, The Son of Man is also Lord on the Sabbath. Now it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught. And a man, who's, uh, who, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely whether he would heal on the Sabbath that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them, and he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored as whole as the other's. But they were filled with rage and discussed with one another what they might do uh, to Jesus. It's interesting, this in uh, Mark and Matthew, they just say he had a withered hand. But you notice Luke tells you it's his right hand that's withered, uh, which is the sort of thing that a physician would probably notice and point out, whereas a tax collector and you know whatever John Mark was, uh, by occupation, might not have, have noticed such a thing like that, a detail like that. Just another little bit of trivia there. Verse 12, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray, and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve whom he named apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Now, remember, you got two Judases there. And it's interesting, when we get to the book of Jude, you know, that is a shortened form of Judas. Kind of interesting that he uh, it might have been one of, uh, it could have been this Jude, or um, uh, I think the Lord had a brother named Judas, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember. There's four brothers named by name, and memory's a little fuzzy right now. But anyway, cutting the name to Jude, you notice you don't see the the book of Pete or Jim or uh, anything uh, like that. But for a Judas, yeah, I'd alter the name a little bit because of what it means. And you notice men don't typically name their sons Judas anymore. Uh, kind of like Goliath, you don't see a whole lot of those or Ahabs or anything like that. But uh, another thing to notice here, uh, verse 12, he continued all night in prayer to God. Now, this was a big decision, appointing the 12 apostles, and Jesus prayed all night. Now, Muslims pray, if they're faithful, five times a day. How many times a day do Christians pray? I mean, I've started having a prayer at the end of the devotional and Bible reading time, but the rest of the day, what do we do for our prayer time besides pray for meals? Do you have prayer with your family before they go to bed, maybe in the mornings? 
Uh, do you have time during the day when you might stop and pray? Yeah, I had a friend once who was in a class. Uh, he, I was single at the time. He was married. And he and his wife were in this class. And there was, I believe, 10 couples. It was one of those marriage classes. It was limited in size. I think that's right, 10 couples. Uh, and of all the people in there, the average amount of time per week that each per it was 20, it was, that's right, it was 10 couples, 20 people. The you want to take a wild guess. What was the average amount of time they spent spent in prayer? Not counting meals, but 20 people over seven days. What was the average? You ready? Less than five minutes. Five minutes uh, of prayer time spread out among 20 people. And we wonder why the church isn't growing. We wonder why our kids aren't being faithful. We wonder why we don't get through tough times real well. Uh, if you're not taking some time to talk to God and taking time for prayer, and, and I mean where it's you and God, just like if you have to discuss something important with a coworker or with your spouse or your kids, uh, are you are you sitting there watching TV while you talk to them or uh, doing other things? Usually we sit down and we put everything aside and we concentrate on the issue at hand. Now, sometimes if I'm talking to my daughter, I might talk to her while we're playing a game or something. But I'm not trying to fix dinner at the same time I'm talking to her or do something that requires a lot of attention. And that's something we need to think about, is are we giving God the attention that he needs? Now, the other thing I want to get into before we finish is the plucking of grain on the Sabbath and what that's all about. And so, because a lot of people will use this as a means of uh, teaching uh, what's known as situational ethics. That is, right and wrong can be determined based on the situation somebody's in, uh, or that right and wrong are subjective. But there's some other things going on here, and there's a couple of commentaries and some notes that I have here. For starters, we are told, or, or the, the Israel was told in the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath, keep it holy. Uh, but it doesn't give any specifics. And then the lawyers got involved. And if you notice, we do the same thing with a lot of our laws. They're kind of vague, and and that, and then so what happens? Well, the, the Congress passes a law, the president signs it, it goes to whichever cabinet department, uh, say the Department of Commerce, just to pick one, and now they get it, and their bureaucrats have to come up with regulations to enforce this law. And then uh, the, the lawyers get involved, and somebody's going to sue to challenge this regulation or that regulation. And then, of course, it goes through the courts, and it turns into a big mess. And it's kind of what happened here, where the, 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 the commandment just said, don't work on the Sabbath. But what constitutes work? Does cooking a meal? How about washing the dishes? What about feeding the cattle? And the Pharisees, uh, this started this before, long before Jesus came along, started uh, these debates and these arguments. Uh, the controversy in Luke revolves around other uh, around issues other than legalism. First and foremost, they like the miracle story. Uh, they, that is the, the uh, controversies uh, and legalism, uh, like the miracle stories, reveal something about the identity of Jesus. Jesus will be called Lord of the Sabbath, that is, the one who has authority to do what he wills on the Sabbath. I mean, ultimately, he's the boss. And if you own the, the, uh, the, the uh, company, you can do pretty much whatever you want with it. Uh, I worked at a place once where the boss and his wife were going to lunch. He didn't have any cash. This is way before everybody had credit cards and debit cards. Neither one had cash. He just walked up to the till and took about 50 bucks out, and off they went. And that was at a time he could have gotten them both lunch for probably $10. Uh, a second issue in these stories has to do with the proper interpretation of the Sabbath law, whereas the Pharisees in these stories seem to be, I really don't like it when he calls it stories, but I've talked about that in other videos seem to be very much concerned with the letter of the law. Jesus is more concerned with the spirit or the intention of the law. That is, why was the, the reason the law was given in the first place? And then here's what the life application commentary says. This day was a problem, however, because the religious leadership had set up strict laws regarding how to observe the Sabbath. 39 categories of forbidden activities, and harvesting was one of them. Now, you could pull your donkey out of the ditch plucking some grain or uh, pulling water out of a well was considered work, but not pulling your donkey out of the ditch. The teachers of the law even went so far as to describe different methods of harvesting. Luke alone wrote that the disciples rubbed off the husks uh, onto their hands. 
This was considered threshing and was against their narrow laws about what constituted work on the Sabbath. Thus, some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? These Pharisees had a skewed view of what was truly unlawful. Farmers are not allowed to reap grain on the Sabbath because they would be engaging in their daily work on, uh, on a day of rest. The disciples, however, were merely picking grain to satisfy their hunger. And it gives Matthew 12, 1 as a reference. This was not their regular profession. According to the religious leaders, however, the disciples were technically harvesting because they were picking wheat and rubbing it in their hands. The disciples were not breaking God's laws, uh, as recorded by Moses. Instead, they were only violating one of the Pharisees' many rules. And then three points. I did this uh, when we were reading through Mark. Uh, three points Jesus made about the Sabbath. And unfortunately, I went back and looked. I don't have my source for this, but I will i think I know where it came from, but I'll have to do a little research on it. Uh, first, uh, Jesus' points about the Sabbath are, first, the Sabbath was not meant to restrict necessities. Jesus' statement in verses, this goes back to Mark, is where I got this from, but it's a parallel passage. David fled from Saul in 1 Samuel 21. He took five loaves of the showbread that was to be eaten only by priests and gave the bread to his men. Uh, David was justified in breaking the ceremonial law because his need for sustenance was greater than, ke than keeping the ceremonial law. And that was the ceremonial law would be, I guess, the rules of procedure uh, is what we would call them in, in, in a legal um, modern American sense. That uh, how you offered your uh, made your offerings to God and that kind of thing. Uh, David broke the ceremonial law not to indulge in a lust to meet a genuine. Let me try that again. He broke the ceremonial law not to indulge a lust, but to meet a genuine need. Meeting true human needs and compassion takes precedent over custom, ritual, ceremony, and tradition. In the Old Testament prophet Hosea, chapter six, verse six. Records God saying, I desired mercy, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. A second point Jesus makes uh, in Mark chapter 2 is uh, that the Sabbath was made to serve man and not man serve the day. And the extreme warping of the original intent of the Sabbath by tradition is seen uh, in history with Antiochus IV, known as Epiphanes. He massacred a group of Jews under the command, and this is you can read about this in the Maccabean books, which are intertestimonial. They happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, he attacked on the Sabbath. They refused to defend themselves. Kind of like the Yom Kippur War in 1974, Egypt and Syria attacked Israel on Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the calendar. Now, they did uh, get their reserve units and, and soldiers and things called up to fight. They were doing uh, Yom Kippur uh, observances, so they weren't ready to fight when Israel or when uh, Egypt and Syria attacked. And then the Sabbath was given to man, the third point Jesus makes, out of the grace of God. God gave man one day in seven that they didn't have to work for a living, but was to rest from his physical labors. And the original intent was for man to use that as a day of reflection for how the Lord had uh, taken care of him for the previous six days. Man was to use that time to rest his body, reflect on the blessings of the Lord, and refresh his spirit by worshiping the Lord. By the time Jesus came into the world, the Jews had perverted the Sabbath and had so regulated it that it was no longer a day of rest, reflection, and refreshment. The Sabbath had become a day of endless rules, regulations, and burdens, ending the Sabbath as God had originally intended it. We've kind of got the same problem today with Sunday. I mean, it's not command. It's not the Sabbath. Saturday is actually the Sabbath. But we don't treat it as a day of rest. It's one of, it is probably the biggest retail day of the week. And you apply at a retail establishment or a restaurant. The first question in the interview is going to be, can you work weekends? Because that's when people go out to eat, the big church crowds that come in after church uh, and people doing this their regular routine shopping. So uh, sometimes I wonder if we Christians didn't just say, okay, we're not going out to restaurants. We're not going to shop. We're going to take Sunday and, and, rest if that wouldn't catch their attention and maybe give us some time uh just as a nation and as a people to take some rest so okay that is the end of our reading and devotional time today so while i've got it uh, on the screen let's go to god in prayer today is wednesday so let's pray for our communities let's pray for our community leaders our mayor city councils and that sort of thing and our neighbors who aren't christians always keep them uh, in our prayers 
So we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for uh, getting us to another midweek and want to pray uh, for our community today and pray for our, our leaders uh, that they will make good decisions here in our local community, good godly sound decisions. Pray for our neighbors, uh, the ones who aren't Christians, Lord, pray that we can get the gospel to them, that they will listen, that we can win souls. And for those who are Christians, help us to strengthen them and the wayward ones to bring back uh, into the fold. And while we're thinking of Wednesday, many churches are having their Bible studies, prayer meetings, gospel meetings, or whatever activities today. We pray for those, Lord, uh, that they will be profitable, that the people uh, uh, preparing for lessons will do a good job preparing and communicate your word effectively to the audience and help them to be tentative, help or uh, attentive, help them to to listen and take what is said with them so that they too can grow in their faith, that they can grow in their knowledge of you and of your word. We pray, Lord, that you'll forgive us of our sins and help us to walk with you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's going to wrap it up for today. If you have any questions on a Bible passage or a topic, leave it in the comment section below or send it to me at 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. If um, if it's on a text, if it's on a subject, and then uh, as I say in the introduction video, at my discretion, I'll decide whether to answer it as a sermon on Sundays or as a minute message or exactly how to get it out there. Uh, depending on my knowledge of the subject and how deep an answer it takes to answer the question. Just make sure your question is as precise as possible so I know without any kind of doubt what you're asking. So that's it for today. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell. We, uh, that's it for today, Wednesday. We will see you in the next video. Have a blessed day. I'm out of here.